Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you at this that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants, participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your moder moderator today. Please go ahead. It includes Kareen Rosbach, who is providing the simultaneous interpretation for those who are joining in French. COVID-19 has focused our collective attention on the need for clear and effective conversations about what people want for themselves and their care. And in doing so, it presents us with an opportunity. Some of you on the call today may have joined us for uh, our prior webinar where we heard about some successful improvement strategies to support effective advanced care planning and serious illness conversations. Today's webinar will give us an opportunity to learn from the current evidence, tools, and resources, and, and reflect on how we can embed shared decision-making approaches in our care to make it more effective. Shared decision-making is such a powerful strategy, and it's so important, especially in times of serious illness. We have a lot of tremendous content from our two presenters today, so with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Claire Ludwig, who will be our moderator for today. A reminder that your lines are muted uh, for the webinar, but please feel free to use the chat box to share your comments and questions, and we'll make sure that, um, that we get your, uh, your questions answered uh, as the webinar unfolds. So thank you again to everyone for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you now, Claire. Thank you, Alan. Can everybody hear me? So it uh, gives me a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, um, Professor Dawn Stacy. Professor Stacy holds a research chair in knowledge translation to patients, uh, is a professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Ottawa, and she's also a senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, where she is director of the Patient Decision Aids Research Group. Professor Stacy is considered a world-renowned expert on the science and practice of shared decision-making. So um, over to you, uh, Professor Stacy, and um, please note that you do have control of your own slides. Introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here to uh, present today. I am decided to take a quote from the Government of Saskatchewan uh, report on their patient first review update, and they nicely uh, outline the problem. Patients and their family members are often not given the opportunity to make informed choices about the best possible care services for their individual needs. With good intent, healthcare providers often believe that they know what's best for their patient and make decisions for the patient rather than with the patient. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is how can we better make decisions with the patient and their families. So in the uh, framework that I like to think about is the multidimensional framework for patient and family engagement in health. And I'm going to be focused on their engagement in direct care level. Um, and if you look at the gray line that's closer to the bottom of the grid, um, you can see that there's various levels by which we can be engaging um, patients and families. So we can consult with them so the patient receives information about a diagnosis, we can involve them by asking them about their preferences, and we can also um, partner or have shared leadership with them where um, decisions are made based on patients' preferences, evidence, and clinical judgment. And the reason why I like this framework is because we can actually look at how can we partner and share leadership with patients and families in policy making, organizational design and governance, research, and in direct care. But for the focus of today's presentation, I will be uh, focused in this uh, far right column uh, in gray around how we can make decisions based on patients' preferences, evidence, and clinical judgment. So shared decision making, um, how it's defined as a process by which decisions are made by the patient and family and clinician using the best available evidence that's available 
and uh, patients and form preferences. And you can see here, according to Weston, this is defined as really the crux of patient-centered care. When I think about shared decision-making, I think we need to be thinking about these three things. One is uh, letting patients and families know that a decision is being made. The second being around what's the information available on options, benefits, harms. And we use the word here, exchange, um, because it's good for us to also ask the patients and families what's their view on their options, because often they've found something that they think might be an option for them. And then discussion around what are the patient's and family's values for outcomes of options and what's their overall preference. So actually just back, the key word I've underlined in the definition is process, and so it's not just who makes the decision. If these three things happen and the decision is made based on what's important to the informed patient and family, then really it is considered to be a shared decision-making process. Uh, in this review done by Natalie Joseph Williams, uh, she looked at 44 studies and identified what patients said were the barriers and facilitators to them participating in shared decisions. And they described their individual capacity to participate in shared decision-making depended on having knowledge about the disease, condition, options, outcomes, also all knowledge about their own personal values and preferences. And so from their perspective, they really need us to be talking to them about what's important to you in this decision. Um, but at the same time, they said that there's huge power imbalances uh, that influence their ability to participate in decision making and that they want permission to participate. They want to feel some confidence in their own knowledge and then feel self-efficacy in using their shared decision making skills. So looking at the Cochrane Review on interventions for increasing use of shared decision making by healthcare professionals, the bottom line in the review is that it's more likely to occur if healthcare professionals have training in shared decision making and it's combined with patient interventions such as patient decision aids. And I'm going to be focused more on the uh, interventions that we can be using with patients. So patient decision aids are adjuncts to counseling, so they're not to replace counseling. They provide information on facts around the condition, option, benefits, harms. They often communicate probabilities around what's the chances of something occurring. Um, patient decision aids also help uh, patients and families clarify what's important to them. Um, it might ask them around which benefits and harms matter most. It might talk about patient stories or experiences and uh, ask them what ex uh, stories sort of resonate with them. It also uh, helps guide them in the steps of how to think about the decision, how to communicate with others what's important, and it might have worksheets or lists of questions. To find a patient decision aid, if you Google decision aid, um, and I went in, on our website on the A to Z inventory um, and looked at end of life, and you can see here where there's a number of different uh, patient decision aids. The list's actually uh, quite long. Um, so some around CPR and some around end of life issues. And then I went and I clicked on the one around breathing with a ventilator to stop or stay on the ventilator because this is one of the top decisions these days with COVID. And if you uh, go to the page that describes that decision aid, it was created in 2019, it's created uh, the developers EBSCO Health. And uh, if you, we also indicate how well it performs against the international patient decision aid standards. So it meets the criteria to be a decision aid and it meets the criteria to be lowering the risk of making a biased decision. And then if you click here, you can actually get to a copy of the decision aid where you can see that it talks about stopping the ventilator or staying on the ventilator. And for each of these, what does it involve? How long would the patient live? Would there be any discomfort? What are the risks? Uh, is stopping the ventilator the same as suicide? And so it goes and describes uh, the different options in a balanced parallel format. <clears throat> so patient decision aids can be used before 
interactions with the healthcare team or during those interactions. They're often print materials, um, but they can also be a DVD videos. They can be online that are interactive or online passive materials, which is the example that I just showed you. Um, in latest Cochrane review that we updated in 2017, we found that in the over 100 trials that it improves uh, decision quality. Their patients have much higher knowledge, more accurate risk perceptions, and better match between the values and the choices made. We also know that concurrently um, it reduces decisional conflict, helps the undecided decide, supports patients uh, to be less passive in making decisions, improves patient practitioner communication, and it reduces under overuse of options. And so if, uh, for elective surgery, for example, once patients find out that there's alternative options, that the actual in, uh, number of elective surgeries might decrease. Um, in PSA testing, it showed a decrease. In new medi diabetes medications, it actually showed an increase in use of new medications. In this review that was done by Marianne Duran, she looked at 19 studies and found that there was much better outcomes for disadvantaged populations when they used um, decision aids, and it actually might be more beneficial to disadvantaged than for those with higher literacy or socioeconomic status. And the reason I put this slide in is because often people, one of the barriers is they, the, the discussion around, oh, the patient doesn't have adequate literacy skills to participate in decision making. And so what we know is that patient decision aids that are written with, uh, for people with lower literacy actually helps them be more involved in the decision. So in around 2003, we started to become concerned uh, because already the BMJ published the first systematic review in 1999 showing that patient decision aids work. And we were concerned um, that if patient decision aids can uh, affect the uptake of options, there is a risk uh, that the uptake of options can be good if decision aids are unbiased and the change addresses variations due to poor understanding or preference misdiagnosis. But we also had concerns if the uptake of options is due to biased information being presented. And uh, I'm a professor in the School of Nursing and we sent the students out to find a decision aid on breastfeeding versus bottle feeding and they found a decision aid published by the, um, a company that produces infant formula. So that would be an example where it's likely to have more biased information that's in favor of using formula feeding infants. So in 2003, we established the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration to enhance quality and effectiveness of patient decision aids by establishing a shared evidence-informed framework for providing their content, development, implementation, and evaluation. And you can see who's uh, on the steering committee. We have representation from many countries. And we're currently in the process of updating the evidence for these um, standards. These standards have been adopted by the um, Washington State Healthcare Authority, who has the only program in the world to certify patient decision aids. And this is just an example of the first uh, nine criteria, mostly that need to be present for it to be defined as a decision aid. The, one of the other pieces around use of patient decision aids is people want to see how does it work. Uh, and so on the website at Laval University, you can actually go and link onto this YouTube video that demonstrates using a patient decision aid in a clinical consultation. Um, and it's only five minutes long, and it discusses how, or shows how it can be used to discuss um, options in this example for use of antibiotics for upper respiratory infections. Um, but we also on our website link to a number of different videos demonstrating shared decision making with and without use of patient decision aids. So in terms of take home messages, there's various patient decision aids that are available. We often have many on the same topic. Um, Medicare and Medicaid in the USA reimburses for patient decision aid use for some decisions, um, but some of the US decision aids are owned and uh, 
there's a copyright, so it's not possible to get access to them. Um, the Ottawa Personal Decision Guide can be used as a patient decision aid um, by adding information on options, benefits, harms, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And you can also evaluate your patient education materials against the international standards to find out how close they are to meeting the standards for providing information in a structure that helps uh, patients with making these decisions. So the other intervention that I want to just spend a couple minutes on is decision coaching. So decision coaching is provided by trained healthcare professionals who are non-directive and provide support that aims to develop patient skills in thinking about the options, preparing for discussing the decision in the clinician consultation, and then implementing the chosen option. Um, decision coaching can be delivered face-to-face -face or on the telephone. In that review I discussed earlier by Natalie Joseph Williams, when they asked patients how the barriers could be addressed, the patients uh, said that they want to enhance workflow, they wanted nurses to explain the information, provide support by listening to patient preferences, and provide doctors with patients' preferences. So patients didn't feel that they had the, the power or the ability to override these barriers on their own. They wanted support from others. So in terms of, co this is very much within the role of um, people who are providing decision coaching. So decision coaching is provided by nurses, by social workers on the team, psychologists, and in surgical decisions, even family physicians have provided decision coaching and discussing the decision with their, their patients. We did a review a number of years ago looking at what does uh, the evidence for decision coaching. We know it improves knowledge. It improves knowledge similar to those that received a patient decision aid, and it had improved or no difference on other outcomes. And so it's not harmful. If anything, it helps um, support decision making. So to find a decision support tool to help with any kind of decision and for decision coaching, if you um, Google generic decision aid or go on our website for the Ottawa Personal Decision Guides, you can find uh, the, the original Ottawa Personal Decision Guide available in multiple languages. And we also have a version for two people where it actually captures preferences and values for uh, two people rather than just the single person. And this is what it looks like, the version for one person. You can write down the th one to three options, what are the reasons to choose the option or reasons to avoid, and then it also asks to you to rate how important is each of these uh, reasons to choose or avoid so that you're really getting at what's most important to you in this decision. So in terms of uh, decision coaching take-home messages, um, it can really be provided by anyone on the team. And it's really focused on, not, on being non-directive, which I said in the beginning, and listening to the patient and helping them walk through the, the um, steps in decision making. Um, we, most people need training or experience in how to provide decision coaching. The Ottawa Personal Decision Guide can be used by patients on their own or to guide the coaching. Um, and as I mentioned, it's available in 10 languages. So I'm going to stop here on this slide. I think this is my last slide on our website. And so if you come to the website, um, I also wanted to highlight that we've also started developing decision aids specific to COVID pandemic. Um, so the first two that were developed was around, should I live elsewhere, stay in my retirement residence during the pandemic, or should I? And then the second one was around long-term care and nursing home. And these were developed because there's um, messages in the media around take your loved one out of retirement homes or long-term care and bringing them home. Um, but this decision is a tougher decision and one that you need to really consider what are the benefits or the harms around this decision. So these decision aids provide uh, information to help people make this, this, this decision. We have a decision aid also in development around um, mechanical ventilation for COVID that really looks at uh, sort of weighing what are the benefits or harms of mechanical ventilation and informing decisions around uh, for frail elderly, and also we're looking at whether or not we would 
develop one for people younger as well. So decision aids can be really made on any topic, any one that's a little bit more difficult or tough and needs help in thinking through what are the uh, options and what's important to the patient and their family. I'm going to end it at this point and open it up for comments or questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Stacy. Um, we've had some comments uh, and questions that have come through our chat box. Um, and uh, just one of the questions in the chat box is, how widespread in Canada is the use of patient decision aids for shared decision making related to serious illness and end of life discussions? So I would say that uh, the use of shared decision making and decision aids is not widespread in Canada, um, mainly because we don't have any kind of requirement to use these types of tools. I'm doing work in Australia where shared decision making is required as part of hospital accreditation and uh, use of decision aids is part of that. In NICE in the UK, as part of the patient experience, it's recommended use of patient decision aids. Even for COVID, it's actually recommending use of patient decision aids. Um, but in Canada, we have no requirements for, and no funding mechanisms for requiring use. Thank you uh, for that. And I'm just wondering, uh, there's, there's been a lot of uh, uh, comments in the chat box. Um, uh, I think a lot of it relates to, um, do you have any advice for clinicians uh, and for patients who really want to build their capacity in shared decision making? So on our website, we actually have um, tools for training of clinicians. And so if you look down the left, side here uh, under step 4.2 under the implementation toolkit. We actually provide an on online training in shared decision making and also we do training workshops. Um, in terms of targeting patients, we in Ottawa haven't done work in this area, but I do have colleagues in Sydney, Australia that have done and are in the process of doing training for um, patients and the public. That will be interesting to see the, uh, the results of, of that. Uh, and just one final question before we go over to uh, Dr. Highland. Um, what, are there any uh, specific clinical areas where decision aids are used um, more than in other areas? So one of the areas that I find that they're more used in Canada, England, uh, US, and Australia is in dialysis, the decisions around dialysis, hemo versus peritoneal dialysis, home dialysis versus coming into the hospital for dialysis. Um, I've done work with Saskatchewan and in Ottawa where we've used it with joint replacement. Also in Saskatchewan and Ottawa where we've used decision aids for prostate cancer where there's multiple options. Um, but it's really in Canada, it's more for individual decisions where they've been tested in studies as opposed to with full-scale implementation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that response. Uh, and um, we hopefully will have some time uh, at the end after Dr. Highland's presentation for additional questions. But um, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Darren Highland. Uh, he's, the critical, he's a critical care doctor at Kingston Health Sciences Center and professor of medicine and epidemiology at Queen's University. Um, and he currently serves as the director of the Clinical Evaluation Research Unit, unit at Kingston Health Sciences Center. And of note, um, Dr. Highland shared the Canadian researchers at the End of Life Network, uh, which had a focus on developing and evaluating strategies to improve communication and decision making at end of life. So without further ado, uh, it gives me pleasure now to turn over to Dr. Darren Highland. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be a part of this program, and I think it's a good uh, follow-on from Professor Stacy's review of decision making or decision aids in general to where she kind of left off there with a few specific decision aids in, in serious illness, um, because that's the space that, that I work in, 
Uh, I'm an ICU doctor where I, I guess quite frequently we're making decisions regarding the use or, or the non-use of life-sustaining treatments, uh, regarding the admission to intensive care unit, regarding uh, the cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And generally speaking, I would say my lived experience is that people are ill-prepared to arrive at that place or that space where we're making these kinds of decisions. And I like this anecdote from a woman who we interviewed after the death of her husband, uh, who was enrolled in a longitudinal study, and where she really communicated her sense of inadequacy, if not vulnerability, in being unable to talk about you know, death and dying. And therefore, that processing that's required to clarify values and be able to articulate preferences, which is so critical for shared decision making, was absent. And how are these kind of people going to move forward and engage in shared decision making without those communication skills or that sense of confidence if, if we as healthcare professionals and advocates for patients don't help them? Um, in our survey work of large numbers of older patients in hospital and their families, uh, we kind of looked at what's important, what they're least satisfied with, and identified these as priority elements for improving the care of seriously ill older patients. And on the bottom of the slide there, you can see that um, communication decision making is super important from their perspective, that we tackle this, that we improve this. So I want to just briefly um, highlight a couple of deficiencies in the communication decision making process from our research here in Canada. And then what evolved from our research are a couple of novel decision aids. And hope to engage you with how we best disseminate this information and oh my gosh, so timely given that COVID is upon us and people are in a heightened state of awareness and anxiety about how, we, uh, how they optimally make decisions. Can I use this slide to communicate more precisely my approach to thinking through um, medical decision making around the use or non-use of life-sustaining treatments with the ultimate goal of making sure that the treatments that are prescribed or the treatments that are received are consistent with or founded on the patient's values and, and, and goals. So that, that's the big picture, and that's very consistent with shared decision-making models as well. On the left side of the screen, um, I've got labeled their advanced care planning, and I know you had a prior session on advanced care planning, and I think any advanced thinking and preparing for the future is good. Um, but this is very different than what I'm about to talk about. So whereas advanced care planning is usually decontextualized, where there's no medical input, there's no defined clinical problem, people on their own are reflecting on what's important to them. And perhaps the most important part of advanced care planning is that naming and capacitation of a substitute decision maker. But over to the right on, on the other side is a separate and distinct process of where a patient um, goes through a communication decision-making process that is involve medical input, that is contextualized, meaning it's around a particular problem, and follows healthcare law where we get informed consent from people. So there's a rich conversation about the risks and benefits and possible outcomes. And, and that's really where you know decision aids can be helpful to us in making those in-the-moment decisions so to be sure patients get you know, the right medical treatment for them. Um, one of my concerns is that people use advanced care planning and advanced care planning documents as the informed treatment decision. Of course, that's not the case. These should be viewed as preparatory uh, decisional processes that then inform a richer conversation where truly informed consent is obtained in the moment uh, about uh, the medical problem. So that's really what my conceptual framework is. Let me highlight some problems that were illuminated in some research that we've done over the last two decades. Um, we observed an increased number of older patients being admitted to ICUs uh, as society ages, and we really lacked uh, quantitative information about prognosis, about how they would fare um, if they're critically ill and they come into an intensive care unit environment. And so we enrolled a large number of uh, Canadian older adults admitted to ICU, 80 years or older, and their families, and followed them for 12 months. And I'm not going to talk about the 
useful prognostic information, but rather I want to highlight just some perspectives from the family members that really shine the light on problems with communication and decision making. So we would have interviewed these family members a couple of days after admission of the patient, um, elicited values and, and treatment preferences uh, for, for as in their role as proxies, and they're saying things like, no, no, the most important value would be that the patient be kept comfortable and suffer as little as possible, and the least important value would be that life be preserved at all costs. Um, and then when we looked at the preferences, we would see that a good 25% of people are saying comfort measures only is what is indicated, um, is what is the, the, the treatment preference. And yet, remember, all of these patients are already in an ICU receiving life-sustaining treatment uh, for quite a prolonged period of time. Those that passed away died on average 10 days after ICU admission. And so you just got to wonder if that's, you know, a high quality finish, if people are saying that the governing value should be comfort, a good quarter of them are, are expressing that as a treatment preference, and yet these patients are in ICU. Now, this isn't just a problem in the ICU. We go on to the hospital wards and we spend maybe up to an hour in some cases in the context of a research project um, really going through a rigorous process and a personal engagement to define what those person, that person's values and preferences are. And then we go out to the chart and we look at the medical order for the use of CPR. And we documented a very large error rate where the person is saying, I want X, and they're signed up for Y. So on average, that happened 37% of the time. The majority of times that we're patients signed up for overtreatment, meaning they were signed up for CPR when, in fact, when we went through this process, we elicited a value and a preference consistent with not wanting CPR. And what I found most disconcerting was the tremendous range um, in that variability of that medical error, up to 82% in some hospitals, and yet other hospitals are able to lower that um, error rate. And so there's, there, there's some ways of improving this and doing it better. But really, bottom line is many older patients are at risk of receiving inadequate or inappropriate treatment. And we have to reflect on, well, why is that happening? What is the cause of these medical errors? And this list isn't meant to be an exhaustive one, but it's going to be some of the points that I want to address. I have research evidence and clinical experience that doctors really don't engage their patients to have these comprehensive planning discussions. And if they do engage, um, they use inadequate language strategies uh, where we're not eliciting values optimally. We're not using the language of shared decision-making, which then puts us at risk of these medical errors. And even if we, we do engage, we use non-transparent methods to then translate that information that we get from the patient around, regarding their values and preferences into a medical order. And because it's non-transparent, it's been documented to be irreproducible or unreliable, which again, puts that patient at risk of receiving the wrong uh, treatment. There's issues around documentation and availability of documentation, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to address those today. So we did a large-scale survey in Canada um, talking to doctors and nurses working in acute care settings, trying to get from them what they perceived as those barriers to having these sort of planning conversations so that they get the medical treatments that are right for, for them. And whilst there's a long list here, I'm highlighting the things at the top of the slide had to do with the degree of preparedness and understanding of both the family member and the patient. So you can appreciate that there is a role for decision making, or decision aids rather, to increase the level of understanding, increase the level of preparedness, but that might reduce the barrier that the physician or clinicians have to engage their patients. And so the more we can do in advance of the clinical encounter to prepare people for serious illness decision making, then more likely the decisional encounter will go smoothly and the patients get the medical treatments that are right for them. So I participated in some dialogue around, now that COVID's here, we need to get our end of life plans in place. And I was one of the ones that was saying, well, just a minute here, because this idea 
Uh, again, thinking ahead, planning is always good, but don't think that just because you filled out an end-of-life care plan that that's going to be helpful in the context of COVID. Most end-of-life care plans go something like, when I am dying, I want this or I don't want that. But at the point where I need to make a decision to apply life-sustaining treatment, intubate a COVID patient, for example, I don't know if this patient is dying. There's uncertainty about the outcome. And that uncertainty then has a, a different set of requirements for decision making. And, and so plans laid in advance in the form of advanced care plan for the end of life are not that useful and contribute to that unreliability or irreproducibility because the doctor then has to make a translational step of, oh, they said this about when they were dying. Well, what does that mean about now that they're seriously ill? And I'm not sure, you know, if they are dying. And so in our planning tools, plan well guide, which I'll introduce in a second, we go through a lot of um, information exchange to try and help people understand that we're, you know, this is what serious illness is. It's like COVID pneumonia, or it's like a major heart attack or a traffic accident where you, you've been banged up, you're in bad shape, you could die, but you could also recover. And under that context, we need, need to make decisions for about what treatments that would be right for you. And in fact, we're very explicit in trying to say, you know, we're not actually making decisions today, but rather we're preparing you for that future decisional encounter with your doctor where under a shared decision-making model, they're going to ask you questions about your values and your preferences. And so what we really try and help people do through these decision aids is clarify what are their authentic values. And again, our research suggests that people um, aren't very good at articulating these in a way that's meaningful to us as, as a clinician. In other words, we don't, they don't see the necessary conflict or competition between two competing ideas. When we ask an open-ended question like, you know, what's important to you uh, in the context of serious illness decision making, well, they may say something like, well, my mother, she was a fighter. The implication being there that, you know, she should have every chance at living and that we should maximally apply life-sustaining treatments. But what is not um, transparent in that conversation, that, that, that effort to fight at all costs comes at a cost. There is a conflicting value of quality of life. And so can we improve the rigor of how we're eliciting values by asking it in a constraining method where we're, we're making sure the person realizes what they're giving up in order to get what they're after. And so we talk about constraining values clarification tools. And they're very simple. And this is an example of what we use in both PlanWell Guide and my ICU guide, where we're getting the respondent to discriminate which end of the spectrum is, uh, is, is right for them. Are they the kind of person that wants to focus on quality? Or are they the kind of person that wants to focus on prolonging life? Are they the kind of person that is OK with the use of machines? Or are they the kind of person that would prefer a natural death and not being attached to machines? So they go through this very transparent values clarification exercise. And then we can use those values scales um, to create a grid where their responses then can map out onto a potential uh, treatment option. And I'll, men I'll come back to the use of that word potential in a minute. But I really like this grid because, again, it makes transparent to both the provider and the patient how those values connect to a potential treatment plan. Um, so it's no longer just in the headspace of the clinician. Uh, that connection is made transparent, again, reducing the risk then of misinterpretation and error. Now, I say potential um, treatment uh, plan because I think in our efforts to uh, respect patient autonomy, um, we treat them too much as informed agents, as people who know what they want and all we have to do is ask them. Um, when it comes to life-sustaining treatments, and I'll use CPR as an example, actually we've got w really good documentation that these are, these are older patients on hospital wards with a CPR order on their chart, and they don't know anything about the processes of care or the potential outcome of care. So they're ill-informed. So simply saying, hey, what do you want us to do? Or uh, I'm worried about if your heart would stop, you know, do you want us to resuscitate you? Oh, oh yeah, sure, do it. 
it would be really inadequate ways of approaching the subject when they're so ill-informed. And so one of the things that we've tried to do in Plan Well Guide is to create that first-in-class decision aid where we're following those IFDES criteria, as Dr. Stacey, or Professor Stacy highlighted, we try and explicate for that user what are the risks, benefits, and potential outcomes of going to intensive care or just getting medical care on the word or just receiving comfort care by itself. And, and that includes, you know, a video um, CPR decision aid where if, if someone is interested in that or thinking about it and wanting to rule it out, they can watch a six-minute video and be informed about the risk benefits and possible outcomes. So that, you know, now you come, if, if you've been through this planning process, you come into into the decisional encounter with informed treatment preferences. So here's an example of our uh, the screenshot of the landing page of our website, uh, planwellguide.com. And uh, when you go through that planning process, the outcome is what we call a dear doctor letter, which is, well, one of those things that addresses the power imbalance that uh, Professor St Stacy was referring to because um, this is really a, a crib sheet or a cheat sheet, a script, if you will, for a patient to use when, when in that clinical encounter, dear doctor, I've been through this planning process, this is what I understand, this is what I learned, here are my values, here are my informed treatment preferences, and here are my outstanding questions that I'd like to discuss before we resolve the matter and come up with the, the final decision. So again, our whole purpose in these decision aids is not to make treatment decisions in advance, but rather to prepare the person for a shared decision-making encounter with the clinician, and this dear doctor levels the playing field a little bit, giving them um, a, a way to more meaningful interact with that clinician with a greater sense of self-efficacy that they can get what they, oops, uh, what they want by that. Let me just go back. So what I'm trying to highlight with this visual is that what we've tried to do then is implement the plan well guide so that the clinician in advance prescribes to the person to go do this virtual planning tool. They get equipped with that dear doctor letter. They discuss that with their family. They come back for that decisional encounter with the, with the physician who then uh, ensures that they get the medical treatments that are right for them. So um, maybe you were exposed to a whole bunch of, you know, advanced care planning tools, uh, end-of-life care planning tools at a prior webinar. And so I thought it would be useful for me just to, again, state clearly what I'm, what's different about PlanWell Guide than these other planning tools is that we're, we're not talking about planning for terminal care. We're talking about planning for serious illness. And so we spend a lot of time discriminating the difference there and um, how we make these medical decisions under conditions of uncertainty. Uh, we think that we're using the best-in-class approach to making shared decision-making by using constraining values clarifications and not just open-ended questions. Um, we use a grid, which is, um, makes the whole process transparent. Again, that's unique and innovative to Plan Well Guide. And uh, we provide that first-in-class decision aid that explicates the difference between ICU medical and comfort care. And that um, Dear Doctor letter, which enhances the collaboration uh, with the doctors. And so I'll briefly mention a randomized controlled trial that was just completed. Sorry, it was completed last year, but just published last month in CMAJ Open where in primary care we randomize patients to usual care uh, versus uh, exposure to the plan well guide process and showed that we reduced um, or increased the likelihood that patients will get the care that's right for them, reduced decisional conflict. Both physicians and patients were very satisfied with the experience. And importantly, physicians spent less time finalizing those goals of care compared to usual care patients. And if, if time was a barrier to engagement uh, from the physician's point of view, then that, that is a really important strategy to reduce those barriers. And we tried to think through strategies to enable the easy implementation of Plan Well Guide into primary care and, and perhaps other settings with posters to create awareness, prescription pads to have physicians to have tools to engage those patients in advance of the clinical decision-making encounter, and of course not everybody works on the web, and so we've got a, a pamphlet version as well, where the last four pages of the pamphlet version are the equivalent of the Dear Doctor letter, so you don't even have to go onto the web. Um, ideally, 
people have time in advance of the clinical encounter to go through that preparatory process. But recognizing particularly with COVID, if somebody's short of breath and presents to the emergency room or presents to you in a clinic or even in an ICU setting where you, you don't have time to send somebody away to work through a decision aid, we try to reduce the essence of the optimal values clarification process and that grid to a worksheet. So this is a two-page worksheet for clinicians to use, a visual approach that put in front of the patient and say, tell me what kind of person are you? Are you the kind of person that, you know, is okay with medical treatments focused on prolonging your life, or are you the kind of person that um, would have your medical treatments focus on quality? Tell me what number represents, you know, your your uh, personal situation. Same, same approach with the use of machines at the end of life versus the natural death. And then, again, in the form of a visual in front of the patient, work it through onto that grid and suggest that, okay, well, maybe this is the medical treatment that's right for you. What do you think? And then using words, explain the risk benefits and possible outcomes of these different medical treatments. So, again, the patient doesn't have the advantage of um, being equipped beforehand, but you as a clinician or the clinician have the advantage of making the process transparent and eliciting the values in what I believe to be the most rigorous way. Um, I don't have time to go through this, but we have a similar approach that's developed for people in ICU already. And you know, obviously now our focus is on family members of critically ill patients. And so we have um, myicuguide.ca uh, where we're uh, trying to equip those substitute decision makers then to be prepared for the clinical encounter where they then have to make a decision or review a decision about the use and continued use or the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. Um, there's not an adhered doctor letter, but instead we have a questionnaire that uh, the family member answers a bunch of questions and prints off a report that is the equivalent of a dear doctor letter that catalogs in a robust way, the person's values and preferences, and again, any outstanding issues. And again, pamphlet versions are available for that online tool for those that don't want to uh, work online. And it, the process is very similar, that when you have a critically ill patient, you have family members that could be engaged in advance of the family conference where goals of care are discussed, and so they go through this deliberative process uh, online or with a pamphlet. They discuss it amongst the family, and then they come back to that family conference better able to articulate the patient's values and inform treatment preferences to support shared decision making. So my last slide is just to say that, you know, my research over the last 20 years has shows gross inadequacy in end-of-life decision making and decision making around serious illness. And a lot of that stems from our lack of discriminating the difference between an end-of-life decision and decisions of serious illness where we have an uncertainty about the outcome. Um, a lot of those inadequacies stem from us as health care professionals who I, I believe use inadequate strategies to elicit values and preferences. And from people not having thought about this enough or not having enough understanding about what they say and how they say it and how that links to how we make medical treatment um, decisions. And so that's why decision aids play such an important role to uh, in reduce medical error or increase the chance that patients get the right medical treatments for them. And, and clearly physicians and clinicians need to engage with these patients and families to, to make better decisions, but, you know, their lack of preparedness and their lack of time are major barriers. And so, again, decision aids can play a role there in preparing the patient to have a better experience with the clinician, and that can be done more efficiently with tools such as Planwell Guide and My ICU Guide. So thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry, I did have one more slide that we uh, also need to address the other side of the equation, and I think Professor Stacy talked about that briefly, that if we've got this patient who's been prepared to play in the sandbox of shared decision-making, but then they encounter clinicians who, who don't know how to do that or who don't respect the language or understand the language of shared decision-making, that's a problem. So there needs to be a combined approach to upregulating clinicians on the use of the language related to shared decision-making as well as preparing our patients. Thanks very much for your attention. Happy to answer any questions.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Highland. I think that's uh, been a very important uh, distinction um, in terms of the language that's used around um, decision making for end of life and, and treatment decisions. We have a couple of uh, very specific questions um, for you and then we'll move more generally uh, to questions for both uh, yourself and uh, Professor Stacy. So in terms of um, the plan well, um, there's a question from the chat box regarding the feedback. What's been the feedback of people's experience using, um, using this as a tool and how well has it linked with other shared decision-making tools? Um, feedback has been tremendous, uh, particularly with COVID. Uh, we've seen a thousand-fold increase in our website and a lot of um, press generated about it. From our users, a lot of positive comments from our research evaluation in the context of the randomized controlled trial, high levels of satisfaction. Um, perhaps the one criticism or comment we get back a lot is, wow, there's a lot of information here, difficult to absorb. Um, and I guess we have erred on the side of you know, a bit, you know, giving them a bit more than they want. You do have an option to take the more parsimonious route through it, or the short guide, if you will, if you want. Um, but uh, that would be the only uh, sort of negative comment we get back is there's a lot here. And for some who perhaps their informational preferences are, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want all of this information. I'd rather have a lighter version than that's why we created the lighter version. In terms of linking with other um, shared decision-making tools, um, I'm not sure, probably not really linked. Uh, this is a first-in-class tool in terms of a broad holistic approach to um, you know helping people make decisions under conditions of uncertainty so very different than other end-of-life planning tools so there's not really that connection thank you um, and just there was one specific question um, regarding uh, prolonging life and I think this again relates to people's understanding and uh, be re being really informed. So I'm wondering if you could um, uh, just respond to the question about um, is there some way as, as a patient or a caregiver going through this um, about knowing what that definition of prolonging a life would, would, look, would be, would well, look like? Yeah, and I guess I don't think that's a big uh, problem for, for them understanding that. We, we in fact, took that from existing literature on um, what, what, what do people say are, are possible goals of care for using or not using medical treatments and having a focus on prolonging life, like you know, trying to seek for survival as the goal versus having treatments that focus on quality. So that, that's not our language making that up. That came from existing mostly qualitative and some quantitative literature where we get a sense of the the, the main the main goals that people from a person's perspective are that dish, that trade off between quality and quantity and the and the other trade off being the use of machines uh, and the, the non use of machines so um, we we don't find a lot of problems people understanding uh, understanding those trade offs mm -hmm. and and perhaps that really is in the context of having those conversations um, and so I'm just wondering more generally uh, and. Uh, I think I'll uh, go to Professor Stacy here. Um, just more generally, how can we work towards raising um, general public awareness or societal awareness about uh, shared decision making, whether that is um, for these very serious illness um, conversations that we have or whether that is um, just more broadly into uh, specific treatment decisions. So. Um, you know, that you've referenced some barriers to that, but ha more generally, how, how do we go about raising public awareness? So from my perspective, I think it would be helpful if we had some kind of Canadian place, like we have our website for Ottawa and Dr. Aylin has his for their tools. So I think a lot of the information is on researcher-specific websites. Um, but one of the things that's lacking in Canada is a central site. So in Australia, the um, Commission 
Australian Commission on Quality and Safety have a website where they have the information on shared decision making, videos, training, decision aids. Um, so they have a central resource for the country. Um, so I think that's one of the first steps forward I think uh, we need in Canada is to have some kind of central clearing, a central place where we can go to get the information for the public for everybody. Thank you. Okay. And um, Dr. Hyland, just quickly, is there anything that you would like to, to add to Professor Stacy comment there? Yeah, just an incremental comment because I agree with what she said, but I think there needs to be a public-facing, you know, public health campaign, if you will, to try and help people lean into this space of being more informed uh, about their how, how medical decisions are made and the role of decision aids. Uh, I find that there's a lot of trust, um, and that trust is actually a barrier to high-quality decisions. People think, oh, the doctor will do well by me, or the healthcare system will do well by me, or my family will do well by me, and therefore they don't lean in and take charge of their own health. I mean, we wouldn't let people buy our car for us based on what they think we would want, right? We invest of ourselves to figure out what are the features, you know, what, I'm, what am I really looking for, what can I afford, blah, 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 blah. So why do people pay, play such a passive role when it comes to serious illness decision making? And how do we educate them to step in, lean into this space, and then make available to them decision aids that they can actualize on? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, context like this, sharing, um, sharing the uh, research that uh, both, of, both uh, yourself and Professor Stacy um, have spent you, the last few decades um, really advancing the science and the practice. And so I would like to uh, give you a, a huge thank you um, for helping to uh, raise awareness um, and we've had quite uh, quite good representation across the health system uh, on the call today. So thank you both very much. You're welcome. And just just to let everybody know, um, we will be posting the the webinar. We'll also be making uh, the resources available um, to you. So uh, thank you so much for joining today. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.